So let's get started. Um, this is Theology of Technology, A Blessing or a Curse, is our topic. And so our aim tonight is to answer three main questions. The first is, what does the Bible say about the role of technology in God's story? And then, is technology neutral, bad, good? What, how are we going to talk about it morally? And how should we assess technologies in order to flourish in a digital age? Those are our three questions. So, uh, first of all, let's get our meanings uh, all squared away. So we want to define technology. It's changed and developed uh, in the last 2,500 years. Um, in ancient Greece, techni meant the skill or art of making things. And then it became uh, the tools used to make things, technology was. And then currently, we refer to technology even as the things made with the tools. So there's sort of four layers of meaning. But the, the resource I use mainly for this was John Dyer's book. And he gives this sort of broad working definition, which you should keep in your mind when we say technology as we're going through. He says, technology is the human activity transfer are you okay? Transform God's creation for practical purposes. Okay? So keep that in mind. Are we having a problem? Okay. These are the two sources I used, and I used some more too, but these are the main books I used. Um, one is called From the Garden to the City, and this is by John Dyer. Really interesting book. And so we're going to go through kind of his, his thesis. And then I also use Neil Postman's classic book, Technopoly. So the first question, remember, is what is the role of technology in God's story? We're going to go through for the four stages, creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. So first of all, what's the role of technology in creation? Well, in Genesis 1.26, creativity should be considered as one of the ways humans reflect God's image. And uh, it says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And as Dorothy Sayers says, at this point, the main thing we know about God is that he is the creator, right? So certainly one of the ways we reflect God's image is through our creativity, and then in Genesis 2.15, God called man to cultivate or work till the, the garden and keep the garden. Remember, it was cultivate and keep the garden. And we assume, we could assume that Adam probably used, created some tools to help him do that. Now, God, it seems God designed the garden in such a way that it needed to be worked on, you know, Gardens grow and need to be tended, right? Uh, he didn't intend for it to just stay the way it was or grow cha chaotically. So, but he did give some limitations to Adam. He wasn't to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he was, remember the word keep? He was to keep the garden in its original form. So he could cultivate it and tend it but keep it mainly in the, in the form that God had. So there's a balance between creating, cultivating, and keeping. In Genesis 2.19, we see that Adam used language, which is a creative tool. It's the earliest creative tool, I think, to name the animals. And language helps us to categorize, communicate, and understand the world. We don't think about language being a tool, but we, we could say that according to the broad definition. OK, so what can we say about creation? The creative impulse and ability to make things from what God has made, or technology, is a good gift from God and reflects the image of God in humanity. OK, are you with me? How does that sound? That's not too far off, right? But had you ever thought about that in, in terms of the creation story? 
Yeah. Right, right. And you, you, you would be using God's creation to also do work other things, right? You would need tools. Yeah. There's more, there, there's more in each of these categories. I'm just hitting, hitting the high points, but that was good. Okay, well, let's move to t- technology in the fall. So in Genesis 3, 1 through 6, we have the account of the fall. And because of the fall now... Our creative acts are now built from the sin-cursed material, and our own sin is involved also. And our sin amplifies our bent towards self and away from God. Okay, so from this point onward, we're dealing in a broken world, okay? And in Genesis 3, 7, after they they, uh, sinned, Adam and Eve um, saw that they were naked. They wanted to cover themselves, so they created coverings of fig leaves. And I would say it was twofold for practical purposes and also as a way of solving the sin problem and shame they had and to live independent or do something to solve the problem independently from God. But notice that God didn't, when, when they did that, God doesn't condemn them for that. There's no account of God saying, you shouldn't have tried to do that. Instead, God gave them a technology upgrade. He, he makes animal skins. God himself is doing technology now. Can we say that? He took from what he had made to make something else to help them overcome some of the effects of the fall, maybe protection for themselves as they're out, they're going to be banished from the garden, right? So they need the, they need better clothing. Um, So God didn't condemn their creative efforts, but he upgraded and helped them make new technology. And then Cain So after Cain killed Abel, God punished him. Remember, he was the cultivator of the ground. He was the farmer, remember? And God cursed his ground, shall no longer yield its strength to you. And then he banished him from from his home and said, you shall be a wanderer now. So Cain wandered east of Eden for a while and then built a city called Enoch. And very interestingly, this city was built with technology and creative arts. In, in Genesis 4, 16 through 22, it says there were tents, there was music, musical instruments. Uh, they forged tools from bronze and iron. So this is the first city, we think. And Cain used technology mostly to live independently from God. So what can we say about technology in the fall? I think we will conclude that every technology now has a double meaning. So it's good because the creativity that is used to make technology reflects God's image in us, our creative impulse and our creative ability. But then this gift is corrupted when humans reject God and use technology as an attempt to live independently from him. Okay, is that, is that good? That makes sense. What about in redemption, in redemptive acts that we see in the Bible? Well, in Genesis 6, Noah's Ark, we have the account, and... Um, Actually, God designed the ark himself to temporarily protect humanity. He gave the blueprints to Noah, what materials. It was supposed to be gopher wood. Um, The material was supposed to be pitch to put it together. And he also gave him precise measurements. So the ark, like the animal skins, temporarily protected humanity from the judgment of the flood, you could say. And, but the ark was not the final savior. So it was a partial temporary relief, right, from the, from, from the effects of the fall. Um, in 11.4, we have the Tower of Babel. 
So the people joined together, and they had one language, and they built a big tower, a technological achievement, I would say. And the tower used the tar and pitch, that the same word that's used that God told Noah to use for the ark. Um, and in this technology, they're kind of abusing their creative powers because they're rejecting God's plan for them to fill the earth. They're all huddled together, right? But instead of God just destroying the tower, which he could have done, right? God could have just said, enough, and destroyed the tower. Um, he used te the technology of language. Remember, we said language is a tool, a te technology, to achieve his purpose for them to spread throughout the earth, fill the earth. So he broke the ties of the universal language to push humanity toward his purposes. OK? And then, wait a minute, let's see, one more. Oh, Ten Commandments, right? Hey, and do you think of writing as being a technology? So God used the technology of writing to convey his law on stone. He was communicating that it was permanent and literally set in stone, right? So it wasn't just in Moses' mind for him to share with just those people orally. It was like more substantial and generational. Um, so God was communicating that his law was permanent, but the law wasn't the ultimate savior, right? It was also a relief from the effects of the fall, if you want to say, but it wasn't the ultimate redemption. And then we have the early church, they used common Greek language to preach the gospel. They used the Roman roads to travel between major cities, ships to travel by sea. And they used the codex, which was a new technology, instead of scrolls, and it made the scripture more easy to travel, mobile, right? So what can we conclude, you know, generally from technology in redemption? So God sometimes participates with humanity in creating technology and approves of humans using technology to accomplish his purposes. Technology can give us a limited partial relief from the curse, but God is the ultimate solution for redemption and salvation. Okay, how's that set with y'all? Is that reasonable? Okay, so, so far we're in every stage. What about restoration? What, a, you know, <laughs> this is the most inter interesting one, I think. Okay, so remember the first city was Cain's. But in Hebrews eleven sixteen and Revelation 21, God will redeem the idea of the city because the new city in the new earth is going to be our eternity, right? It's city, the city where it's usually portrayed as evil in scripture now is, is transformed. We are Christians journeying from the garden to the city, which is the title of Dyer's book. Um, and then here, in 1 Corinthians 11, 26 says, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And if you think about it, the bread and wine are products of creativity, human creativity. We don't partake of a grain of wheat and crunch on it and then eat a grape for communion, do we, right? So in Micah 4, 3, and Isaiah um, 2, 4, some tools, and in, in here it's weapons, will be redeemed, restored, or transformed, I would say. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. So I think we could say some human technology will be restored and be free from evil and the unintended consequences. And 
actually, if you think about it, some technology will be obsolete. What do you think would be up that we won't need? What will become obsolete? Lights. Lights? I had that. What? Digipets. <laughs> I was thinking medicine. That's a big, you know, discipline that we won't need. How about weapons for war? All those weapons for war we won't need. So you can think, you can begin to think of what's not going to be there. Will we have music? I think it, yeah. So music is going to be even better, I would say. But it's a tech, music is technology, and it won't, it won't be obsolete. So let's conclude about restoration. Technology isn't a temporary aberration of our fallen world. God will not eliminate all technology in the new earth. The promise of the new city is not merely that God will resurrect. <laughs> okay. We'll resur God's not just going to resurrect believers in body and soul. I don't think it's on. Is it on? No, just one in your face. Oh, 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 sorry. Well, that's okay. He will also restore and transform some human technology to a world that is then untainted by sin. Okay, what do y'all think about that? Had you ever thought about that? And but with our broad definition of technology, you can see how, how some technology is going to be in the new earth, right? We're not going back. To, in other words, have you heard people say, well, we're going to go back to the garden? And that's not really necessarily the case because we've had a lot of creativity happen that God's going to keep in the new earth, right? Will our Wi-Fi connect perfectly? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we, we might have a better answer for that as we go along. We'll never have recording issues again. No, no recording issues ever again. Okay. Okay, so that's our first question. What does the Bible have to say about the role of technology in God's story? And I think I agree with him. This, these are Dyer's conclusions. I'm, I'm giving you what is in his book, and I'm, you know, so he says technology plays some role in every stage of God's story, all four stages that we went through. So now let's talk about technology. Is it neutral, bad, or good, like morally? So the first idea or the first view is that technology is neutral. This is the most common and probably the view you have, I'm just saying. Um, it was my view till a few, for a few years until I really started reading. But how we use technology, this view says how we use technology determines whether it's good or bad. So a tool is not good or evil. It's the human using it that makes it good or bad. Um, in other words, technology has no inherent values. It's valueless. It's neutral. So uh, examples would be, well, nuclear technology can be used for either bombs and mass destruction or for generating power, right? So it just depends on how you use it. I can use a shovel to build a church, or if I just murdered someone, <sighs> with a shovel, and, but might need to dig a, bury them, right, with the shovel. That's just called, so technology is neutral is another word for a, an interest, instrumentalist view of technology, okay? Everybody, is that good? And is that your view? It makes sense, right? Sam? It does. Yeah, it makes sense. I think it's, it's so... It's, it's the common view, it's a reasonable view, but it's not the whole picture. Yeah? Perhaps it's even true to a certain extent at the moment, uh, insofar as humans have uh, a fallen nature, we often observe being used in this way. Yeah. 
So the next view would be, well, technology is inherently bad. It, it operates with evil and inhumane values, independent of whether a human agent, right? So an example would be like, I used to want to be Amish for a little while, but no. <laughs> the Amish believe technology undermines their values and cultures culture and traditions. Like they, they would say, um, a car, um, I'm going to get to mine. Like uh, a car would pull the community apart by providing mobility and sort of eroding local ties. That's what the Amish, how they, they might explain as some technology being inherently bad. For them, yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, I'm, I, I know I'm going to get to that. OK, but it wouldn't be inherently evil, right? Because there's some good for social media. So, it's, it's, so it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be uh, operate only with evil. But we would say, and this is, uh, came to me from Michael, thankfully, torture devices are probably, wouldn't we say, essentially evil. Right? Just like Wesley was in the pit of despair. Look, it's terrible. And he's, I don't know what, what uh, you know, they cranked up the, don't you know Princess Bride? Right? I know you don't. <laughs> you still haven't, you're going to watch that movie if it's the last thing I do. Oh my gosh, we're going to have to watch it, yeah. What? There are lots of torture devices at my gym. At your gym, right. Well, but they're not essentially evil because you could use them for good, right? So this is the life-sucking machine. Did y'all know what it was called? Yeah. And, but you know the pit of despair. So torture devices, we would agree, are essentially evil. So this view would be a deterministic view of technology, meaning that it operates independently. It's evil independent of how you use it. So what's needed, I think, since we answered both those ways, is we need a critical approach. Because if we grant that some technology is inherently evil, then technology can't be totally neutral all the time. It can't be merely neutral. So, and here's why we can say that and say it's a mixed bag. The righteous and the wicked person, the person who builds the church, the person who murders, they use the same shovel, but they both get calluses and blisters from the shovel. Doesn't, mean, doesn't matter how they use the shovel, it still has an effect on them. Does that make sense? No? So it's, it's a both and. So it is to do with human agency, but also regardless of human agency, the uh, medium, the shovel, shapes you. So here, here's how I would explain it, Audrey. Um, there's now two as aspects of technology. What technology does for us is its good or bad use, the church or the burying the dead body. What technology does to us is what shapes is the blisters and the calluses with the shovel. Does that make sense? So there's two things at work. There's two aspects always. So we need a critical approach to be wise about the content, what we're using, what we're using technology for, but also we need to know how it's shaping us, right? Sorry about that. There you go. Does that make, does that, okay. Um, so, is technology neutral, bad, or good? Actually, all of the above, right? <laughs> so we need a critical approach when it comes to evaluating whether a new technology is good or bad. Because it has the power to shape us, we have to learn how to detect how it shapes us to become wise stewards of what God has given us. So this next section is not about what content you view on digital media. 
uh, that's good or bad, and I'm, I'm assuming you all know what's good or bad content. This is about what, the techno what technology, how it shapes us. It's about the medium. Jackson. So under the critical view, there's no objectively bad object. There's no objectively there can be, yeah, because we agreed there were, there were torture machines. Were you in here for the torture machine? Oh, no, I wasn't. Okay. Yeah, there can be. Yeah. So would an example kind of be like the GPS, where once you have the GPS, it inadvertently you start to lose your ability to navigate yourself? That's right. That's exactly what we're going to do. That's one of my examples. Yeah. It's exactly like that. So there's good things for it. So to critically assess technology, you've got to be able to say there's good stuff that's happening, but also you have to be able to assess how, what, what, what's the human cost? What skills are you losing? Or how is it shaping you away from humanity or away from God? OK? So I, this, this is the next section. I think it's the most important. So now we have. 30 minutes. Can I do it? Where's Ben? Oh, gosh. I want to do it for Zach so bad that we end at 930. OK. So there's, I'm going to give you four big ideas on how to assess technology. OK? And this is the big idea in a nutshell, even though we're going to go through all this information. So this is from Ivan Illich. And um, he wrote a book called um, where is it? Uh, Tools for Conviviality. He was a philosopher of technology. Technology is the water we swim in. In order to flourish, it's critical that we know what it means to be wet. So that's what we're going to talk about. So the first idea, first big idea, is all technology, we just said that a little bit, all technolog technological change is a trade off. It gives and takes away. It gives us good, and then it takes away some of our humanity. Michael Harris puts it this way. If every, <clears throat> every technology will separate us from some part of our humanity, and that's its job, and we want it to. For, I, I like my washing machine. It separates me from having to go to the river to wash my clothes. But our job is to notice what its job is and what is it taking away, and then be wise in modifying my use of it or be aware of it. OK? That's the first idea. <clears throat> um, OK, no, we're going to go back. Sorry. I have more to say about that. <clears throat> I want to give you some examples of how people are wise. And, you kn and th these are simple examples so that you can extrapolate, OK? Socrates believed that learning through dialogue was ideal. He believed in oral learning. <clears throat> it was the ideal way to learn and gain wisdom. So he didn't like writing or relying on writing because he thought you w it would diminish your memory and your, your deep learning. You wouldn't know something in your soul. You would just know it superficially. So he chose not to write anything. <clears throat> that was his solution. <laughs> Thankfully, Plato did. But so Socrates was very extreme. He just decided he wasn't going to write anything because that was his conviction. So <clears throat> let's go to the Apostle John. In 2 John 1.12, the Apostle John said that <clears throat> He was very intentional about whether he was going to write a letter, write something to you, or come talk to you about it face to face. Um, he said, I have many things to write you, but I would rather say some things when I see you face to face. So he's picking and choosing what he writes and what he tells you face to face in conversation. Uh, in John 20, 30 through 31, he, was also, he also limited the amount of information he gives us in the gospel. At, towards the end of John, he says, Jesus did many other signs, not written here, but this gospel is written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and you may have life in his name. So he didn't overload you with information. I, can, I think of John as the book of John as being very structured and orderly and has all the evidence you need, right, to believe 
that Christ is the Messiah. So uh, that's different from the information we get today. And we're going to kind of get into that. Um, so knowing there's a trade-off, we can choose how to use technology wisely so as not to diminish our humanity. So you can choose when to text someone and when to talk to them in person. Has anyone ever broken up with you in a text? That's very bad behavior. I have heard of that, right? You, there are certain things you don't want to do through, a, through text or on social media. You want to do them in person. So intent, did you know that intentionality, what you choose to think about and what you choose to do, is a very unique human good, our, our ability to be intentional. So the fact that we can choose, and we're going to talk about free will a little bit in Katie's, Katie's uh, topic, but that you can choose whether, how you use technology. OK, that was what I wanted to say about that. The, oh, no, I'm going forward. OK, sorry. OK, so the next big idea is, the second big idea is that technological change is not additive, but ecological. So what does that mean? Does anybody, has anyone ever watched the Jetsons? Have you, have you really? Seriously? OK, it was a cartoon that I watched as a youngster. So remember the Jetsons? They're a, they're a family that were portrayed in 2062. That was the year that they were supposed to be depicting. But the Jetsons family were pretty much the storylines and everything, if you can remember. They're like a normal 1962 family, like leave it to beaver-ish family. So they, they have the very same lives and problems in their little storylines. Uh, but they just had extra technology. They had a robot maid. He, you know, George Jetson, when he goes to work, all he does is pull a lever, remember? That was his work. And, you know, anyway. OK, so the idea here is that any, in any given ecosystem, so it's not, don't, this is called the Jetson's fallacy, by the way. So don't be like a person that thinks that technology is just additive. Um, it's more like an ecosystem. So in any given ecosystem, there's a careful balance of resources. There's predators, there's prey, there's, it, there's, a, there's a balance of resources. But when a new species is introduced into an environment, it affects, Jackson would know about this. Aren't you environmental? OK, there you go. Um, affects all the other plants and animals in the system. Some things are destroyed, maybe, or become obsolete. It messes it. it in other words, it changes the entire ecosystem when something is artificially added in, right? So examples of this are like, you can just ask yourself, how did the culture change when, some, when X was invented? So when the clock was invented, that's a long time ago, or the printing press, or more recently, the birth control pill, or the internet, or smartphones, or credit cards. Um, like, I went to a restaurant in the Woodlands last year, and it was like we were just getting coffee. And I tried to beg cash, and they wouldn't take cash. They took no cash. You had to have a credit card to eat at this restaurant. I don't remember the name of it. Um, like, does anyone have a pay, get the paper delivered anymore? We quit our pay. We used to have the Wall Street delivered. Now we get it di digitally. Do we go to Blockbuster anymore? No. <laughs> does anyone have a landline phone? Your grandma still has a landline? Do you have a landline? Like now? Uh, oh, at home. OK. Well, sometimes you need a landline. But I mean, most, I figured most of you probably don't have a landline. We got rid of our landline. Let, no, Sam, you don't have a landline. OK. So that's the second idea. 
is that technol technological change is pervasive to the culture. You're not just adding something in and everything stays the same. The third idea is that we have generational gaps in our views of technology, OK? So every invention already in the world when you were born, you, you think of as normal, right? Whenever you were born, the technology we had when you were born is pretty much normal to you. <laughs> now, Postman says 30 on this, and I got to thinking, I think it's more like 40 now. But I put any technology invented before you're 40 is just exciting and creative, right? You don't, you, you don't critically assess it too much, but it's just exciting. But after you're 40, everything pretty much will bring about the death of society. So just get ready for it. That's how it seems. That, that's how it feels. Sam? I don't know. I feel like maybe it's 20. Pulling back from 40 and actually it's more like 20. <laughs> really? It's like, with what's being invented? Well, well because it, this, I, I you mean with the rate right, of invention? Uh, oh, they just invented you know, some AI that will guide missile systems. And oh, they just invented right. uh, well, okay, 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 artificial one. So basically, maybe for us, uh, I, I was thinking y'all would appreciate me saying 40, but actually, you probably, it is more like 30, or maybe we should say 20. And that's because of why. It's the rate of, of progress, right, of everything. The speed, the speed of new invention, new technology. Yeah. How did you feel when, People were letting something called Alexa in their house and having something constantly listen to you. I know. I don't have that in my house. I would never do that. I would never do that. To me, it's like bringing about the death of society. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't ha I don't use it in my car. Uh, my husband has it in his car. Hello, Mercedes. That's a good question. You know, and he asks a question. I, I don't have any of that stuff. So, yeah. I'm not a Luddite, but yeah, some things freak, are not intuitive to me. OK, so I want to talk about this just a little bit. Because um, the danger then, which I'm not sure you have, because we just discussed sort of the dangers. But it's when you become passive and you no longer question new technology. So Postman thinks if you, if you haven't critically assessed the technologies you were born with, born into, which a lot of us, we don't, then you're not going to see the importance of assessing new technologies as much. So he thinks it's worth going ahead and assessing what we lost. We're talking about, like if you talk about the history of information, going from oral learning to writing to, uh, I have, uh, the printing press, to the telegraph, to images, graphics, television, computer, internet, smartphone. If you go through the history of something like that and, and consider the benefits, which are there, right? We would never argue that. But the human cost that's involved at every stage, right? And some of it is weird because, like, we had 200 years to get used to the printing press. We didn't have that long to get used to the, some of the stuff that we're dealing with. So the shorter time period to adjust our culture to stuff is also shortening. Um, ben asked me to talk about cars. What about the invention of the car? What changed in culture with that? Lots. Um, you know, Henry Ford also created uh, for the car assembly lines, mass production, right? It created jobs, which was good, and also the need for oil and gas. Oh, but guess what? We're also, and we're free to move away from family, take, take other jobs far away. But what about the emissions that are harmful for the environment that now we've created? So then, in response to that, we've got electric cars coming along, right? And then we have a new invention, self-driving cars, right? Have you, have you seen one? Have you seen a driverless car? I saw a pizza delivery car 
Have you, Trey? Well, and sometimes they hit pedestrians because they're because they can't use good judgment on on what they're visualizing, right? I'm, I'm say they what it can um, have judgment about driving, right? And the whole thing with self-driving cars was that we have accidents because drivers have poor judgment, right? Sometimes, so they think. <laughs> okay, but let me tell you something I read. So this is funny, too, because um, I'll say this one little thing, and then we have to move on. Um, they were just around the corner, right, a couple of years ago. Did you, didn't, didn't you think self-driving cars were about to be a thing? But it slowed down quite a bit. I'm not even sure it's going to be a thing. But if it is, I read an article that said, we're going to all, if you're a pedestrian, you're going to be required to wear a sensor all over, you know, sensors on you because, so that the self-driving car can sense you and not run over you and, and, you know, mistake you for something else. And if you're not going to wear, if you don't submit, so this is the shaping you, is what I'm saying. If you don't <laughs> submit to the sensors, if you get hit, you probably, uh, it, it, it's going to be your fault, and you won't get compensated for your injuries. How does that sound? Sensors on the deer? Yeah, you could be, I guess you could put sensors on. That would be pretty funny. Ra get all the deer in the, in the neighborhood up and put sensors on them. Sam? Can I make a bet? What? A bet. A bet? I, do you think there's going to, you mean about... You think they'll ha they'll have self-driving cars? Okay. So I'll, th that example is just to tell you um, that's what's meant by thinking about the trade-offs and the ecologi ecolo ecological changes in society that were that that need to be critically thought about new technologies. Okay. So. Let's talk about the fourth idea, and, there's, and I have about six things um, to talk about, and we'll see how many we get to. So the fourth idea is this idea that technology has inherent values. It's not merely neutral. The first is disembodiment, it's value, uh, the value of disembodiment. Um, technologies like the internet, social media platforms, virtual reality platforms, Zoom, they all de-emphasize embodiment, right? Just, it's just how, how it works. Um, being digitally connected isn't the same as being physically present with people. And I think we felt this during the lockdowns, right? This came home to us. So these are good things. But I'm just, I'm just pointing out their value is disembodiment. Uh-huh, Sam? Does that also apply to things like power tools or um, giant machines where... Well, I think ain't, like other tools are invented to extend our physical abilities. And digital technologies extend our mental capacities. So it, it, it puts the body out of the equation, right? So, yeah, I think when we're talking about before digital technology, we're talking about extending our physical um, capacities. Um, Christianity has a robust theology of embodiment. We're body and soul or body and mind, and we're meant to experience life in contact with nature and the real world. So human embodiment is the proper state of our existence, you would say. And another argument would be the incarnation of Jesus and his bodily resurrection emphasize the value of embodiment. So, uh, and ultimately, we will be embodied with resurrection bodies in eternity. So I think there's a Christian argument for 
being mindful of those technologies having that value. So the next value is expressive individualism. And um, I don't know if any of you have heard of Carl Truman. He has a new book, a uh, recent book out called Strange New World. He uses this term. And it's defined as when we find our meaning and identity by expressing our own feelings and desires. So your feelings and desires shape your um, identity and meaning in your life. Instead of how it, sh how it should be as a Christian, conforming our feelings and desires to truth and reality. We're conforming our, we should be conforming ourselves to truth and reality rather than constructing our own identity. So social media platforms promote this idea. Um, you could present a highly manicured and unrealistic version of yourself. Do we do that? We do, don't we? Do you ever post really bad pictures of yourself? <laughs> I delete bad pictures on my phone all the time. I didn't like that picture. I'll just delete it. Um, so social media, VR platforms, promise that you can be whoever you want to be. And alternatively, God's purpose is to transform my character to be like Christ, to be the person he created me to be, not to construct my own identity. Okay? And I think this one especially, value is an example of technology amplifying our bent toward ourself and away from God, which was what we first saw, you know, in, create, in the very first part. So information overload. Po uh, Neil Postman claims that our ability to order information coherently has been diminished in the digital age. In the past, information came to us more in context, context and more orderly. It was, he said it was more like opening a new deck of cards. We could reasonably see the sequence of suits in numbered order and we could anticipate the next card. Now our information environment is more like a shuffle deck and it's much more difficult for us to manage the information that, we, that we're getting all disorderly, disordered. So when our minds are overloaded with disordered data, it's challenging to know what's reliable, which kind of goes to our debunking uh, article that we talked about. We either believe in anything or we become extremely skeptical about information that we get. And I think these were the two responses um, very typical with the COVID vaccine. And can you think of other things? So you, you find people who are very, you know, gullible, maybe you would say, um, they take everything or they're extremely skeptical about everything because, because of the situation. They can't order, can't understand, can't sort the information. So Postman thinks that this information overload has caused an increase in the use of courts to settle matters. So, you know, we have cultural debates all the time. Congress has debates about stuff. And have you ever heard, you know, the news people or even people debating saying, well, that, that's probably going to go to the Supreme Court. They're going to have to decide this because no one can agree. No one can decide what's right. No one can settle this matter. It's going to go to the courts. There's going to be a lawsuit, right? And I think this is very interesting because he says uh, the reason for it is because the court has strict rules about information, right? They only allow certain kinds of evidence. They don't take speculation is disallowed, person opi person of personal opinion or hearsay is disallowed. Um, there's a structure of how to present evidence. And a theory of justice defines what information is relevant, right? A lawyer can stand, stand up and say, I object, that's irrelevant. You know, everything has to be relevant to the case at, at hand to be able to decide. So the rules governing the relevance of information in, in courts help manage the chaos. And so that's his opinion about why everything seems to be 
I don't know whether you notice it. I notice it being my age that everything seems to end up in, in the courts. Do y'all feel that way? I mean, do you know what I'm talking about? It does seem like more and more of our politics and our rules of law is done by the yeah. courts and less and less done by, like, Congress. Congress. Yeah. yeah. So the next value is efficiency, speed, and labor saving. I kind of lump that all together. Um, the speed of information that we receive from, from digital media kind of makes our expectations wonky. What I mean by that is we become impatient with slow things and things that take a long time to, to accomplish or do, right? So that's a, that's a shaping of us. And then on the labor saving, um, we do seem to assume that less work and more leisure will be better and make us happier, right? Um, but there is such a thing as a paradox of work. And there are two uh, University of Chicago um, professors, and they did this study, and they say um, it's a paradox because even though we desire more leisure or to get out of work, we actually experience more positive feelings and happiness when we have to work for something. So there's a paradox there. We are always assuming, and the technology assumes, that we're going to like getting out of work when actually we have more. We have more. We flourish more when we, have, when we work for something. Um, the efficiency and speed, I kind of equate to sh our shortened attention spans. Um, it means we're less able to engage in deep thinking books like this, where we are today. You know, you might be going, is she ever going to shut up? This is getting so long. This is more than eight seconds. Um, attention without subway surfers or Minecraft. Yeah, or, or, stuff, or checking your, no, one, no one's been checking their phone. Zach's not here. So, uh, uh, so that's good. I, yeah, yeah, 140, yeah. See? TED Talks, you know, short. Um, so there was a, believe it or not, Microsoft did a, a, a study in 2015. And they, they uh, studied 2,000 Canadians. So it was Canadians. Is anybody Canadian? No. <laughs> Canadian, so maybe, maybe we should debunk it. But of people, of, uh, people over 18, who played games online, and they determined that over time, and they, had, they did EEGs on them, that their attention span shortened to about eight seconds, which is less than a goldfish, uh, goldfish attention span. I thought that was pretty. That was in 2015. All, well, I know. I know. Um, it's an interesting article. If you want to read the article, I'll give it to you. What? What kind of technology does a goldfish have? I know, I know. None. None. OK. But you do notice that, right? I even notice that, because I need to read a lot of long reason books and stuff. And um, I find it hard to just keep at it and, and be focused. I mean, how do you feel in having to read stuff for your studies? Do you, are, do, do you have to always take a break, check your phone, check your messages? What? What do you mean? Yeah. What do you mean, read? You, you, you think I actually do the textbook readings? So labor, again, on labor saving, I have, uh, we've shifted our intelligence from ourselves, not, you know, our memory a lot, to uh, a computer, right, or our digital devices. So things like memory, reading, and writing skills are often externalized. So I'm thinking of chatbots. Offloading our intelligence eliminates the discipline and struggle we, we have with researching something, reading, writing well. And so like um, 
we asked Chatbot to um, title my talk. And Zach put in, I think he put in my title, which was very boring, Theology of Technology, A Blessing or a Curse. And guess what Chatbot gave us? It's what you saw. What? A bunch of emojis. A bunch of emojis. It is tech our savior or doomed creation? Not bad, right? Okay. That's just an example. I think it's ironic. So Chatbot gave us a pretty good title. But if we overuse things like large language models, we're at the risk of, of just losing that skill and creativity ourselves. If we had thought about it long enough, could we have thought of something just as creative? Probably, right? Um, so it's going to handicap us if we overuse it in the long run. Um, also, if that's not enough, just know that by simply using your smartphone, your time, attention, and your intentionality and your data become the products sold to advertisers. So you're not the consumer anymore when you take out your smartphone. You're the product, right? Which is kind of, kind, kind, you, you don't want to be that. You'd rather be in charge, be the consumer, but basically you're the product. There's one more thing, and I won't give a bunch of examples because we're out of time. And the value is it as in device paradigms. So a device hides a long process or a humanly skilled process. Um, technology often makes a difficult process available at the press of a button or a flip of a switch. Um, it replaces something we used to do a skill we used to have, it replaces that. So a tool, like Sam was saying, helps you do something, and a device does something for you. OK? So I'm glad for heating and air conditioning, aren't we all? But that's the example of a device. What did it used to be to heat your home? Chop the wood, bring in the firewood, start the fire, keep the fireplace going, right? It was a big, long, probably family-oriented, focused practice. So a device replaces a focal practice that grounds us to people, time, and places, and um, it replaces it with a device. I mean, a device replaces that focal practice. And sometimes that skill is just lost or obsolete. So it's what, um, what Katie was saying about our navigation apps. So we're losing our ability to navigate. Now, does that concern you? I mean, it's just something to notice, right? That you probably don't want to lose your ability to navigate. Um, how about preparing a meal instead of fast food? It's at the, you know, all I have to do is order it and they even bring it to me, right? Instead of. Oh, <laughs> right. Or, you know, what I mean by that, I mean, hardly anyone goes to, well, there are people that go to the grocery store. Y'all probably go to the grocery store. But everybody gets their groceries delivered. Everybody is shopping for them, a skill that they used to have going to the grocery store and everything. Like choosing between different fruits and what's good and what's, what's bad. What's good, what's bad. I mean, yeah. Um, how about your banking? Who, who's been to the bank lately to cash a check or, right? Did you, did you have to go to the bank? So we hardly go to the bank because we have mobile, we can deposit our checks, you know. I just deposited cash. You deposited cash? Oh, well. So there you go. You didn't spend it. That was good. Yeah, try. Those are just older technologies. They're becoming obsolete over time. And that doesn't mean that it's, we're, we're, like, we're getting rid of them and losing those skills because, uh, like, let's, let's take your map, for example. Well, and, I, and, and so you're right. So it's not necessarily like banking, I wouldn't say, losing schools. But what are, what are you losing? Like, my mom went to the bank every week. She knew every teller's name in her, in her little bank. You know what I mean? So human relationships, you're not, you don't know your teller or you don't go, or your cashier at the grocery store, 
right? If you don't go to the grocery store, you don't have the contact with people. Okay, so it's just, just how do you critique it, right? But there are some things lost. Um, we're going to read later on in the semester, we're going to read The Machine Stops. Has anyone ever re read that by Forrester? It's a classic. We're in the reading group. And it, it kind of does this illustration of the human cost of devices and all of that. Okay. Yay! So... We've answered question three with these four big ideas. And our final takeaway is just that technology plays some role in every stage of God's story. And we need to learn how technology shapes us in order to, to critically assess it and be wise. And there are four big ideas about technology that help us assess new technologies and choose to flourish as humans. And that's it. That's it. <laughs>